Hello, ACA Biology class. Um, this is the rest of the Chapter 4 video lecture. I'm just going to kind of skip through um, to where we were. All right, so this next structure is a lysosome. So a lysosome is the garbage disposal for the animal cells. So you really only find lysosomes in animal cells. That's because in plant cells, this um, function of the lysosome, this breaking down of waste, this occurs in the vacuole itself. So in, there are enzymes within the lysosome that aid in breaking down proteins, polysaccharides, lipids, nucleic acids, and even worn out old organelles. So these enzymes are active at a much lower pH than the cytoplasm's pH is. So therefore, the pH within the lysosome is more acidic since it's at a lower pH. Um, and this allows that the reactions that take place within the cytoplasm would not occur in this low pH, and then the lysosome can break it down and the reactions will continue. All right, the next structure is actually a cell wall. So this is not a cell wall. This is um, an image of the chemical structure of cellulose. Um, a cell wall is a rigid covering that protects a plant cell, um, and it provides structural support and gives shape to the cell. Um, many, all plants have cell walls, but there are some fungi and some protists that also have cell walls. Um, we talked about in the prokaryotic cell, the cell wall was made out of a structure called peptidoglycan, and in the plant cells, it's made out of cellulose. And cellulose is a string of or strand of glucose molecules, and they're particularly um, a particular type of glucose, glucose called beta glucose. And they're connected in what we call a 1 4 linkage. So when you're counting um, the glucose, you always start at the zero, it's not a zero, at the oxygen, and then you start and you count counterclockwise. So this would be carbon one, carbon two, carbon three carbon-4. So we call this linkage here with the oxygen between. This is a 1-4 uh, linkage. So and that allows for the carbohydrates to be in a straight line um, and not a branched form. So cellulose is a long unbranched chain of beta glucose molecules connected by 1-4 linkages. So a linkage between the 1 and the 4 carbon. All right, the next structure is the chloroplast. Um, this is a schematic drawing um, of a chloroplast. The chloroplast has both an outer and inner membrane, just like the mitochondria does. And it has membrane structures inside as well. These membrane structures, they're the um, small oval shapes. These are called thylakoids. And a stack of thylakoids is called a granum. Um, or in many granum stacks are called Grana. But the chloroplast also has a liquid um, solution as well. And this liquid solution within the chloroplast is called the stroma. So there are two different types of reactions that happen within the chloroplast for photosynthesis. We have the light dependent reactions, and they take place within the thylakoid membrane. So they take place in these membrane structures. So here you can see one cut open. And this would be the membrane with an um, inner space uh, in the thylakoid. And the other reaction, the making of the sugar for photosynthesis, is going to happen in the stroma. And that's called the Calvin cycle. Just like the mitochondria, chloro chloroplasts also have their own genome. Um, and it is a single circular chromosome. And we'll come back to more information about why that's important and what that could mean in a little bit. All right, so this image, um, this is an image of uh, what we call endosymbiosis. So symbiosis is a relationship in which organisms from two separate species depend upon each other for survival. So you can think about like a parasite and a host or a clownfish and an anemone. They have different types of symbiotic relationships. 
endosymbiosis, the prefix endo means within. And this is a mutually beneficial relationship in which one organism lives within the other. So scientists believe that host cells and bacteria formed from an endosymbiotic relationship when the host cell, and you can see the host cell here, engulfed an aerobic prokaryotic cell. So a cell that was able to make um, its own energy using oxygen. And so it engulfed it and then it was inside. And instead of digesting this um, small prokaryote, it instead uh, has a working mutual, a mutual relationship, a symbiotic relationship with the larger host cell. And then the same thing happened with a photosynthetic prokaryote, so a prokaryote that was able to make its own food. So now we have this host cell, and he's ingested both the photosynthetic prokaryote and the aerobic prokaryote. And we think that these are, this is how we evolved from prokaryotic cells into eukaryotic cells, and particularly uh, explains why the chloroplasts and the mitochondria have their own genome. And this took millions of years of evolution, but this ingested bacteria became more specialized in their functions um, and, again, turning into the chloroplasts and the mitochondria. All right, this is a very, very crappy picture. I apologize. Um, but this is uh, pictures of the vacuole. And the vacuole plays a key role in regulating a cell's concentration of water in changing environmental conditions. So I, I talked briefly um, when we were lecturing in class about how a wilting plant, um, because that water is not within the vacuole, the vacuole does not extend to the edges of the cell wall and thus there's no support for the cell wall and thus allows the plant to wilt or droop. So here you can see a nice full um, central vacuole. It takes up most of the space if you're looking straight down um, or if it's in, um, it could be covered up and could be underneath. So you could have the chloroplast around it or you could be able to see it. So we'll look at those when we're doing our um, cells uh, lab. All right, so this image actually shows the connection between the nucleus, the rough um, endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi. I'm going to spend this particular slide talking about the rough endoplasmic reticulum, then we'll move on to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and then the Golgi in the slide after that. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum, or an endoplasmic reticulum in general, is a series of interconnected membranous sacs. So you can see how all of these sacs are connected um, and not separate. separate. And these um, tubules and sacs collectively modify proteins, but they also synthesize lipids. So an ER has the endoplasmic reticulum has tubules that have hollow portions and uh, the hollow, hollow portion is called a lumen or a cisternal space. And the membrane itself is a phospholipid bilayer and it is embedded with proteins and it's continuous with the nuclear envelope. Here, you're looking at a electron micrograph image. So you can see um, the rough ER. So this is your nucleus with your nucleolus and then your rough ER. And we can see that it's rough ER because you can see little dots of ribosomes beating around the structure. The ribosomes on the rough ER um, transfer the newly synthesized proteins into the lumen space where they can then, the proteins can undergo structural modifications, such as folding or even acquiring side chains. These modified proteins incorporate into cellular membranes. So the ER or the ER's other organelles membranes. So they're going to do jobs within the cell later on. The rough endoplasmic reticulum also makes phospholipids for cell membranes. So that's where your phospholipids are made. If the phospholipids or the proteins are not destined to stay within the 
endoplasmic reticulum itself, they'll reach the destination that they are intended for via little vesicles that will bud off and break from the rough endoplasmic reticulum's membrane. So you also have a smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is also continuous um, with the rough endoplasmic reticulum, but it has very few or almost no ribosomes on it. And its function is to sy synthesize carbohydrates, lipids, and hormones, particularly steroid hormones. It also will um, be used to detoxify medications and poisons, and in some cases, particularly in your muscle cells, it will store calcium ions. All right, so if the um, proteins are destined to go outside of the body, um, they will need to be sorted, tagged, and packaged, and distributed, um, and that all will take place in the Golgi apparatus, also known as the Golgi body. And you can see here, the Golgi body is a series of of flat, non-continuous membranes. The Golgi body has two, or Golgi apparatus has two faces. Um, one face or side that is closest to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and this is called the cis face. And the um, this is where the vesicles that have left the rough endoplasmic reticulum will fuse to the Golgi and will then empty their contents into the Golgi. These proteins can then be modified and sorted by the Golgi apparatus or the enzymes within. The most frequent modification that's done within the Golgi apparatus is adding short sugar molecule chains to the proteins. Then these newly modified proteins and lipids um, will be tagged with phosphate groups or other small molecules in order to get to their proper location. Then when they're ready, they're properly tagged and sorted. Then they'll bud out from the opposite side of the Golgi apparatus, and that side is called the trans face. So the vesicles deposit their contents into other cell parts um, within the cell, or into other secretory vessels, vesicles that will fuse with the plant's plasma membrane and release those proteins um, in the contents outside of the cell. All right, next we have the cytoskeleton. So there are three types of fibers within the cytoskeleton. There's microfilaments, there's intermediate filaments, and there's microtubules. And here is um, an example of all three on here. So uh, microfilaments are going to thicken the cortex, cortex around the cell's inner edge. Like rubber bands, they resist tension. They are, there are microtubules in the cell's interior where they maintain their shape by resisting compressive forces. There are intermediate filaments throughout the cell that also hold the organelles in place. We're going to spend the next... Um, a few slides looking at these in a little bit more detail. So the first thing we have is um, microfilaments, and they are the narrowest of the three filaments. They function in cellular movement, and they have a diameter of about 7 nanometers, so very, very small. They are comprised of two globular protein intertwined strands, that we call actin. So you have two actin filaments that you can see here in a slight twisted shape. So ATP, our adenosine triphosphate, our cellular energy, is going to power actin to assemble its filamentous form, to assemble into this microfilamentous state. And then this microfilamentous state will serve as a track for the movement of a motor protein that we call myosin, and we'll look at myosin um, in class. It's really an amazing uh, molecule. This movement of myosin along the microfilaments, the, along the actin filaments, enables actin to engage in cellular events that require motion, such as cell division in eukaryotic cells and cytoplasmic streaming, which is the cell's cytoplasm circular movement in plant cells. 
Actin and myosin are very, very plentiful in muscle cells. When your actin and myosin filaments slide past each other, that's what actually causes your muscles to contract. Microfilaments also provide some rigidity and shape to the cell. They can depolymerize, which means to disassemble, and reform quickly. So this enables a cell to change its shape and move. And you actually have a lot of cells in your body that do this. White blood cells make really good use of this ability. They can move to an infection site and then phagocytize or eat, engulf the pathogen. All right, the next thing we have is the intermediate filaments. So their diameter is in between. They are a little bit bigger than the microfilaments. Their diameter is 8 to 10 nanometers, so between a microfilament and a microtubule. And they have no role in cell movement, and their function is purely structural. They bear tension, thus maintaining the cell shape, and they anchor the nucleus and other organelles in place. They are the most diverse group of cell cytoskeletal elements, so you have way more of these than the others. You have several fibrous protein types um, are in the intermediate fil filaments. You have lots of different fibrous proteins that make up um, intermediate filaments. But you're probably most familiar with a protein called keratin, and this is the fibrous protein that strengthens your hair, your nails, and the skin's epidermis. And um, in class, I will also show you some porcupine quills that are also made out of keratin. All right, the last of the um, cytoskeleton examples are microtubules. These are um, small hollow tools. They are polymerized dimers of two different types of tubes, one called an alpha tubulin and one called a beta tubulin. So they're both globular proteins, and they make up the microtubules walls. Um, the microtubule has a diameter of about 25 nanometers, um, so much larger than the other two. They are the cytoskeleton's widest component, and they really help the cell to resist compression so the cell doesn't get squished. They provide a track along which vesicles move through the cell, and they pull replicated chromosomes to opposite ends of a dividing cell. So like mic microfilaments, microtubules can disassemble and reform quickly. Um, and they also form the structural components of flagella, cilla, and then those centrioles we talked about earlier. All right, so this is transmission electron micrograph of two flagella. So you can see the microtubules. You have all these different rings. Each of these rings represents a microtubule bundle. Um, so the flagella, and if you're, that's many um, flagellums. So flagellum is singular, flagella is plural, are long hair-like structures that extend from the plasma membrane. And they enable an entire cell to move. Um, a cell can have just one flagellum, um, or it can have a few flagella. You typically don't have um, an enormous, enormous amount, though. Another structure um, that is formed of microtubules is cilia, um, and that is many different um, hair-like structures. So they are... Um, around the entire surface of the cell. They are short, hair-like structures, and they can also move the entire cell, um, or they can move substances along the outside of the outer surface of the cell. Both of these structures, the cilla and the flagella, share a very common structural arrangement of microtubules, and we call this um, arrangement a 9 plus 2 array. Um, this 9 plus 2 array is made of a ring of nine microtubule pairs or doublets, and they surround a single microtubule doublet in the center. So you can see the two, the, the pair or doublet of microtubules in the middle, and then you have the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine um, pairs forming a ring around. 
All right. Another um, piece to the cytoskeleton um, is the extracellular matrix. So you have collagen fibers that are interwoven with um, proteoglycans. Okay. So proteoglycans are carbohydrate containing pro pro protein molecules. Um, and this makes up what we call the extracellular matrix or the outside of the cell um, parts of the cell. So this extracellular matrix holds cells together to form a tissue, but it can also allow the cells um, within the tissue to communicate with each other. So cells have protein receptors on their plasma membranes, extracellular surfaces. When a molecule within the matrix binds to the receptor, it changes the receptor's molecular structure. The receptor, in turn, changes the microfilament's conformation that's positioned just inside the plasma membrane. These conformational changes induce chemical signals inside the cell that can reach the nucleus and turn on or off the transcription of specific DNA sections. This is going to affect the proteins that are made and it can also change the activity within the cell. All right, so plant cells um, can have weird channels. So a plant cell is, you know, the, the most outside structure is a cell wall. Um, but think about like when uh, plant cells need to move water from cell to cell. Well, so they can have a joining, a junction between two plant cells, and this junction is a channel that flows um, and is open between the cell walls, and this is called a plasmodesma. So a plasmodesmata, so that's plasmodesma is um, the channel, and so all of the plasmodesmatas allow materials to pass from one cell cytoplasm to adjacent cell cytoplasm. So these are numerous channels that pass between adjacent plant cells walls connecting the cytoplasm and thus allowing or enabling the transport of materials from cell to cell and thus throughout the plant. Another um, junction between cells is called a tight junction. So a tight junction is just a watertight cell uh, seal excuse me, between two animal cells. Um, this is held together tightly by proteins and prevents materials from leaking between the cells. Tight junctions are typically found in epithelial tissues that line internal organs. So a lot of people think that in epithelial tissues are skin tissues, but it's really just the outer layer of tissue. So all of your organs have an epithelial level as well. Um, and these tight junctions are going to form that inner uh, layer of tissue within most of your internal organs and cavities, as well as forming between your skin. All right, another um, connection between cells is called a des desmosome. And this is um, a very strong um what you kind of call a spot wheeled weld. So it's just a small one connection, but it's very, very strong. So you have very short proteins called cadherins in the plasma membrane, and they connect to intermediate filaments to create these desmosomes. The cadherins connect to adjacent cells and maintain the cells in a sheet-like formation in most of your organs and tissues that stretch. So examples of these would be the skin, your heart, and most of your muscles. And then the last type of junction or joining between two cells is called a gap junction. So a gap junction is a channel between adjacent cells that allows for the transporting of ions, nutrients, and other substances that would enable, enable the cells to communicate. Um, they develop when a set of six proteins called connexins in the plasma membrane arrange themselves in an elongated but donut-like uh, formation. 
when the connexons pores, or you can think of them as donut holes, um, in the adjacent cells line up, then we can form a channel. A channel has been formed between the two cells. Gap junctions are particularly important in cardiac muscle. They allow for the electrical signal for the muscle to contract and uh, passing efficiently through the gap junctions so your heart muscles um, on each side will contract in tandem. So here you have your picture of your gap junction, protein lined poor. This particular one is going to allow water and small molecules to pass through. So gap junctions are in animal cells, and the similar structure that's in plant cells is going to be the plasma desmata. All right, that's it for chapter four. Um, I hope that this wasn't too overwhelming. Please bring any and all of your questions to class and we will regroup. Thanks so much.